This is Rio of Madison Rising, and you're listening to our acoustic version of the Star Spangled Banner here on KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proud? Stripes in bright stars through the perilous fight. Oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming in the rocket's rain. Listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at KLRNRadio.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. 
I'm Richard Harden, and again, I want to thank the Lord and the management of KLRN Radio for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. Today's going to be a very important message. There is something we must do to receive grace. You've heard, you know, quite often people say grace is God's unmerited favor. Well, that is totally incorrect. If unmerited were used to distinguish grace, then there would have to be a merited grace. See, you're talking about merited, unmerited. Unmerited is a characteristic of all of God's manifested love. Mercy, grace, compassion, charity. Therefore, unmerited cannot be used as a defining word now to specify God's love to or on his people, which is associated, you know, with uh, God's mercy love. Now, favor and mercy, God's love on and to his people. In Isaiah 59, 21, uh, the scripture says that this is God's covenant. He said, this is my covenant with the people, my spirit on them, and my words in their mouth to them. See, so uh, in the Old Testament, all the people had that were godly people was God's spirit on them, around them, protecting them like this, and his words to them that he would speak to them. And this is said again in Psalms 25.10. It says, Mercy and truth are all the ways of the Lord to those who obey his testimonies and his covenants. So in the Old Testament, and even today before people receive Christ, people only have God's love on them, to them, and his words to them. And his words then will teach us about his love and teach us about our sin and teach us about Jesus being the answer today. But then there is something we must do to receive his grace. And that's what I want to share with you today because it is so important because so many people say God's uh, grace is God's unmerited favor, undeserved, un, you know, nothing you can do to receive it and things like this. And there is something you can do. There's something you must do to receive God's grace. Now, before I get on into it further, I want to share with you, though, about my website, and I'll be right back. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. This is a very important message. I want to share with you some scriptures that uh, some of them sound like from what they say that... uh, there's nothing you can do or nothing you have to do, but let's look at some of them, and then I'll uh, bring in some explanation to this. Okay, Mark 29, Mark 9, 24, excuse me. Uh, man cried out, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Now, just what is belief and unbelief? Well, like, for example, if you had a problem today and you want to seek the Lord to find out or find out from the Lord what his will is, You'd be in what's called doubt. If, if you have a problem and you don't know what to do and which way to turn and, and, Lord, just what do you want me to do, that is doubt. Okay? When we have a doubt, to get out of doubt, the only way to get out of doubt is to seek the Lord and find out what his will is. So we set ourselves to seek the Lord. And during that seeking period of time, you know, we might be fasting reading study in God's word especially in Isaiah 34:16 says seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read and then uh, we can be fasting giving up food or giving up something else but giving up something important to you so that you remember to pray every time you think of whatever that is like if you give up cigarettes every time you see a cigarette or something like this pray for whatever your problem concern is well, cigarettes may be the problem concern too, but you know uh, you can use that if you're hooked on them and, and you haven't got rid of them yet like that. Use it to something to fast from so that you'll remember to pray. So many people have been delivered cigarettes while they were using that as a means of reminding them to pray. 
But then, anyway, fast and seek the Lord. Study His Word. Look for the promises in the area of the problem you have. Now, believe them. When God speaks to you, when He sends His Word to you and speaks to you and gives you the answer or what He wants you to do, like when Jehoshaphat was surrounded by the three armies, he set himself to seek the Lord. He sought the Lord. He prayed and fasted before the temple, him and all the people of Judah. And then God spoke to him and said, It's not your battle, it's mine. Just go set yourself in the valley of Ziz and see the victory. Well, see, when, when you get to that point to where you know the Lord has spoken to you about what you need to do, that is the belief point. Or that is when you, you know, you know it's God speaking to you. You know what he's told you to do, to teach that class or, you know, work with those young people. Or he wants you to be a preacher or that he wants you to, you know, uh, go to this particular college or, he, you know, just whatever it is you're praying about or take a certain job or something like this. When you know the Lord has identified that to you and it's God's will for you, then that is the belief point. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But see, you've got to know and believe that it's God speaking to you. He may give you a dream, may give you a vision. He may speak through your pastor or, or a friend to you or a Christian friend, something like this. It may be just God speaking to you in your mind or whatever. There's so many different ways. And I have a message on that earlier about um, eight ways that God spoke to people in the Bible. He may just speak to you through any of those ways. But when you know it's God speaking to you, and you know what God has told you, that's not the end of it. That's not the end of your situation or your problem. You have to make a choice. You have to make a choice to accept and receive what he has just spoken to you or reject it. Like Jehoshaphat, he was surrounded by the three armies. When uh, God told him, it's my battle, not yours, that wasn't the end of his problems and concerns right then. Because God told him to him and the people to march out of the gates the next morning singing praises before those three armies. Now, how often do you just march out of you know a, a fortress or something like that singing praises before three armies that every one of them want to kill you? See, what God asks you to do, it may not be something, well, more than likely it would be something you've never done before, like lead a devotional teach a class, work with young people, something like this. And you got all these apprehensions, fear, you say, Well, God, I can't I'm 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 not ready for it. I'm you know, I've never done that before. Well Moses said the same thing, you know, he said, I can't talk very well. I can't go and do that. Jeremiah said, I'm too young. I can't be your, you know, prophet. God said, I'll put my words in your mouth and your heart. As a fire, you know, that you'll speak my words. Well so many people do that. But here's where trust comes in. You've got to trust God enough that when he speaks to you, and you know it's him speaking to you, that he'll provide a way, that he'll go with you, that he'll strengthen you, that he'll help you, and he'll help you to fulfill anything he wants you to do, whether you've ever done those type things before or not. See? you got to trust that he'll do it. Then, if you trust him enough, then, to accept his words to faith, then you'll be walking by faith with God. Uh, and that's how we receive the faith is when, when we know that God has spoken to us clearly and it's His Word, His will for us, then, like Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. But you've got to be able to say, God told me this, and believe it and know it's God speaking to you. Then you accept what He says to faith or you reject it to unbelief. Now, God has promised to bring everybody to a knowledge of salvation. He's promised to bring everybody to know that uh, they're a sinner, that Jesus is the answer, and they need to turn to him. Hebrews 4.2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached unto them did not profit them, not being mixed in faith in them that heard it. Now, see, when God speaks to you about what he wants you to do, it's not going to profit you one bit in fact, you're going to be worse off after if you reject his word, because where else are you going to turn now? If he has the words of life for you, like a disciple says, Lord, where can we turn? You have the words of life. See, if he's answered your uh, request and told you what you want, he wants you to do, to teach that class, to preach, to, you know, um, be, surrender, be a missionary, or just, you know, take this particular job or whatever, 
if you then reject it, where are you going to turn? Then you just go do something because it's not going to be God's will. Anything else you do, you know, He's going to speak to you and show you what His will is in the situation. When the children of Israel came up to the Promised Land, they all knew it was God's will to cross over Jordan into Promised Land, but they rejected His will because those ten spies telling them there's giants in the land, where's grasshoppers to them? They didn't trust God enough that He would take care of them there and open the land up to them. So they rejected it. It says in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19, departing from the living God, they rejected unbelief. That's what unbelief is now. So just because you've heard from God is not the answer to your situational type problem, whatever it is you have. You've got to make the choice. Are you going to accept and obey his words to faith? Do you trust him enough to accept his words? Now, I've heard people say that trust and faith are just interchangeable. You know, you can just use them interchangeable. No, you can't. Do you trust him enough? See, that's based on your relationship you have with him and the knowledge you have with him at this particular time when he speaks to you. But like Jehoshaphat, he said, March out of the gate singing praise. Did they trust him enough to actually do that? Yes, they did. They thanked him for his word, and they bowed down and praised him for his word. Next morning they got up, marched out of the gates, and God performed the victory. They didn't even have to fight. Now, if you reject unbelief, God's word, just like it said there in that particular verse in Hebrews 4.2, uh, gospel preaches to them as well as unto us, said, but the word preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them and her. It did not profit them. That means they didn't go to heaven. You know, they didn't receive God's gospel. His words and everything. And, and that's what it is. If that's what unbelief is, you, you know, but you reject Titus 2.11 says that God, the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. It says also in other places, you know, that, uh, oh, let's see, it's, it's not God's will that any should perish, and that he's going to make his presence known to us. In Romans 1.20, we're all without excuse. So there's not going to be any doubters in heaven, I mean doubters in hell and in the lake of fire. God will have brought everybody to a knowledge of him some way or another. And that's his job, not mine. I don't understand how he does it and everything like that to people all around the world. But as people respond to the light he gives them, he continues to give them more light. Now, so in hell is going to be unbelievers. Lake of fire, unbelievers. People who God brought the truth to, and then like Second Thessalonians 2, 10, 11 says that the people perish because they reject the love of the truth. They reject the love of his words. God and his word are the same. God is love. His word is love. Jesus says in John six sixty three, my words are spirit and they are life. <clears throat> See, so when people respect the spirit, the love of God's word, you know, they can't be saved. Now, Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God, but only if we receive his words into our heart. Now, when his words come into our heart, his spirit coming into our heart then, create in us the work of grace, we say, for salvation. Creates a new heart, a new life. That's why, you know, uh, when the spirit comes into our heart, you know, there is something we must do, see. We must receive his living words to us into our heart for them to come into our heart to perform the work of grace. We don't just, you know, stand around and wait for God to, you know, dump grace in us or something like this, or like it sounds like so many people teach and preach. There's nothing you can do for, to earn your salvation. That's right, you can't earn it by doing good works. There's nothing you can do, you know, it, it, it just, it's up to God. That That's not it. We must receive his words of love. We must receive his words of the gospel, the salvation, like it said in Hebrews 4, 2. The gospel preached them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So when God's teaching you you're a sinner, that, that Jesus is your answer, that he's provided the way, that the wages of death sin, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, when he teaches you that, you've got to receive that into your heart. See, the, the truth of his words and everything, that you must turn to Jesus and call out to him. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except Jesus. Now, if you reject Jesus, you're rejecting all of God's salvation. There's nowhere else to turn.
if you reject, you know, that you're a sinner, there's nowhere else to turn because, you know, you've got to, you know, admit and confess your sins to the Lord. Now, uh, so there is something we must do. We must humble ourselves, humble our hearts before God's word that we're sinners, that Jesus is the answer for our sins, and humble ourselves then and call out to him for salvation. Now, we must believe, yes, but see, that's just one of the steps to it. When, when God speaks to us, his words of love and salvation, and what we need to do, we have to, each time that he speaks to us, make a choice to accept what he's telling us or reject it. If we reject it, we're rejecting to unbelief. And lake of fire and hell is going to be filled with unbelievers, people who have rejected his words of love, his words of salvation. And but Jesus says, Matthew, uh, let's see, 2541, uh, speaking of sheep and the goats, and he's separating the goats, the bad guys, you know, that's going to go to the lake of fire. And like this, says, depart from me, you cursed, in the eternal, everlasting lake of fire created for the devil and his angels. See, the lake of fire and hell was not created for any person. Not one person has been created, predestined to go to the lake of fire. We have to make the choice to accept his words. We're a sinner, that Jesus is the answer, and turn to him, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, and then receive him into our hearts. And it's something we must do. See, you can't bypass any of that. You can't tell him, I'm not a sinner, but I want to go, you know. It, we're all sinners. Because, see, what sin is, we were born without his spirit in our heart. Sin is a separation of the heart from God. We were all born like that. And then when we get up to a age of accountability, and it's different for each person, you know, when God brings us that knowledge that we are a sinner, that we're separated from him, then from that time on, then we must turn to him and ask for his spirit to come in us. Now, we're born void with an empty heart that is none of God's spirit. Ezekiel 36, 26, God says a new heart. We said that his covenant will be with us. You know, speaking through the uh, prophet Ezekiel, he said a new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. You know, the one we was born with. My earthly father. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you. And when his spirit comes in us, that's when we're born into the family of God. We become a child of God, like Galatians 4, 6 says, and because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, you no more a servant but a son, if a son, then heir of God through Christ. A joint heir with Jesus. And in James it says, in 121, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, superfluity of an audience, and receive with meekness, see, meekness, your meekness is you're surrendering yourself down before God's word and you're you know you're getting your pride out of the way getting all these lusts and things like that out of the way and in meekness you turn to the Lord then and it says and receive with meekness the engrafting word which is able to save your souls now and that caused us to grow together from, you know Grafting causes plants and like that to grow together. They're infused together, become one, one vine and everything. Well, Christ is our life and vine now. We're totally dependent upon Christ. We're reconciled to God through Christ coming into our heart. Now we're children of God. Like Jesus says, you must be born again. And see, when his spirit comes in us like that, in 1 Peter 1, 23, he says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, the seed that we're born of is the Spirit of Christ. Galatians 3.16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed was a promise is made. He says, Not as to seeds of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ is the incorruptible seed, the incorruptible Word of God. Because remember now, Christ is God's pure Word. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.24, says, Christ, the power of God, the creator power of God, and the wisdom of God, the wisdom, the pure Word of God. Christ is that incorruptible seed, the Word of God, that comes into us, and we're born then into the family of God. 
and that's a word that we're supposed to be sharing with others. Proverbs 35 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure, a shield, and put their trust in. Add thou not to it, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. When you share something that's just made up by your group or what you think it ought to be or something like this, but it's not God's pure word. It's just our word when we change things. But see, his pure word, he will back up. His pure word, incorruptible word, is Christ. Now, and again, like Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit. He was born of water from your mother and of spirit. But the Spirit of God, the seed of Christ, the living word in you, said he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, so we're not just a, the same person cleaned up going to church. That's not us. He forgives our sins. He creates in us a new heart, gives us all a brand new heart to start living as one of his children. Ezekiel 36, 26 again, a new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. He'll put his spirit in us. I'll take away the stony heart of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. See, we aren't just the same old person. We're better off than the old uh, tadpole, tadpole turn into a frog or like the caterpillar turn into a beautiful butterfly we get a better transformation than that we're transformed into the family of God we're a child of God now we weren't before second Corinthians 5 17 19 says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things passed away behold all things have become new inside you and everything all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus and has given us a ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Jesus Christ in Jesus, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing trespasses against unto them, and hath committed in us a word of reconciliation. We have those words of reconciliation to share with others. Now, as God was in Christ, the world reconciling to himself, not reckoning to them the trespass of them, and placing in us a word of reconciliation. He, he gives us that word to share. We're ambassadors for Christ. And we have no right to change his word, but he wants us to just share his pure word, Christ. Christ, the pure word of God, is, well, like spoke to Moses. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26 says, Moses esteemed the riches of Christ, God's living word spoken to him. Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt. You know, like that. And he turned then and left Egypt. And all that wealth he could have had possibly like that, he turned and served the Lord and went away. Now, Apostle Paul says he was talking to a lot of people there, you know, most of them that had, you know, lived through part of the Old Testament period before that time. He says, this is a mystery of the gospel. See, the people of the Old Testament didn't have that. They got God's forgiveness, and then they had to come back and, you know, each year or offer sacrifices for continued forgiveness, and he covered their sins and everything. But he wanted a better way. And Hebrews chapter 8 says a New Testament covenant is based on greater promises with the foundation of Jesus Christ. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes here. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle 
and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Well, praise the Lord. Welcome back. I want to share with you some scriptures now. These scriptures talk about belief and different things and some of them say just believe and be saved and so on but anyway listen to this as we go through this here psalm 669 says excuse me john 669 says we believe and assure that thou art christ the son of the living god i see that's something that's part of this uh reaching out to the lord for salvation we've got to come to that knowledge and belief that he is who he says he is you know because if we're going to respond to him like that we certainly have to have belief. And in Luke 8, 12, uh, the, one of the big hindrances is that anything we try to do to reach out to the Lord, the devil's going to try to, you know, uh, keep us from it or something. And when uh, the story of the farmer sowing the seed, and some of it falls on, you know, um, hard ground, some falls in, you know, by the wayside, and the birds come and eat it and things like this and everything. It says... Here, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Believe and be saved, see? Not just belief by itself. We believe, and then we have to respond to that belief by humbling ourselves and asking God's forgiveness, inviting him to come into our heart. But this is what happens to so many people. You know, you can share with them, and it's such a joy. They you know, respond in such joy and everything, a twinkle in their eyes and things like this. But the next time you see them, you know, and you ask them about it, it just, they've lost that joy and it didn't last long because they didn't uh, allow God then to continue working with them or something like that. And uh, when problems came or something like that, they turned aside lest they should believe and be saved. Um, John eight twenty four, Jesus says, I say therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now, just believing though that Jesus is the Son of God and that he's our Savior is is not the answer. You say, uh, I, I went into a church one time and they said, we're all believers. Amen. And they said, we believe in Jesus. Amen. And all like that. But see... That's not the end result. Once you believe and know that Jesus made provision for your sins and that you're a sinner, you know, you got to believe, too, that you're a sinner. Jesus made provisions for those sins. And then the scripture says, Whosoever, in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, once you know this information, then you must respond in meekness, like it said in James a while ago, in meekness to the engrafting word, the pure word of God, in your heart, that's what meekness is, is surrendering yourself before the Word of God. Before the Word of God, and then doing what it says to do. See? And what you must do is then humble yourself and say, Lord, please forgive me. Cleanse me of my sins. I want to turn from my sins. Surrender. I want to surrender my heart and life to you and invite you, your spirit, Christ, into my heart to create me in new heart and new life in your name Jesus I ask amen see we must do that knowing to do it is not doing it you know it, it's there's quite a bit of difference in just talking about something and and defining it and actually doing it in your life now our response is that we must respond to the gospel 
Like at Hebrews 4.2 earlier I read, says, you know, the gospel preached them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Well, mixing it with faith is accepting what you've heard and then inviting the Lord to put his spirit of those words into your heart, inviting him to come into your heart. Then the words being Jesus' life, he says in John 6, 63, my words are spirit and life. The words coming alive in your heart then, uh, and the spirit cleansing your heart, creating a new heart to new life. See, but he will not come in uninvited just because he tells you and re reveals himself and gives you a vision or a dream or something like that or however he speaks to you of who he is. And you know that Jesus is the answer. All those 20 something years I was in church, from age 9 to about age 33, something like that, uh, I knew God was real. I was very close to him a lot of times. Uh, I turned at children's home and everything. We went to church every time the door was open like that. I heard all kind of messages, all kind of you know sermons on God's word and things like this. And, and I knew them enough. We had to memorize verses in summer, you know, a daily Bible school in the summertime and everything. Stuff like this and other times throughout the year. I knew a lot of God's word, but I had not received them into my heart. Now, what I mean by receiving them in my heart, if I knew God's word, what do you mean I haven't received them? Well, suppose your mother tells you, eat that spinach, it's good for you. Now, you can eat that spinach, know it's good for you because you trust your mother, and, and even though it tastes terrible and everything, you think, well, you know, you're doing it. But that's not receiving it into your heart. Receiving God's word into your heart is receiving an agreement and tasting and enjoying his word. See, it's different than just being forced to memorize it in your head and to go by the rules of his word and things like this. That's, that's the law. That's just obedience to the law. And we can't do that. Jesus did that for us. And he sacrificed on the cross for us, his perfect walk of faith and obedience to his Father's word. He said, I only do what my Father tells me to do. I only say what my Father tells me to say. He was our perfect sacrifice because none of us could do it. And we still can't. Even after becoming a child of God, we have problems with some of those now. But uh, we've got to receive his word into our heart in agreement. In fact, Jesus says in John uh, with the 15 7 if ye abide in me now and I abide in you and my words abide in you ask what you will and it should be done see now his words abiding in us means we've invited them in uh, somebody abides with you you've invited them into your household you've taken them in they're part of it and everything like this see you're doing it in agreement you're not just doing it begrudgingly well another verse what is it Philippians uh, four twelve says be angry, sin not. No, excuse me. Philippians 4 to It says, uh, Well, I've just lost it. One of my memory verses, and I just completely lost it, so I'll look it up here. Um, Philippians. Since I want to use it here. Excuse me, it's Philippians 2.14. Now, to receive this word into your heart is going to be hard to do. Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without arguing and disputing. Now, that's the Word of God. Now, can we receive that into our heart when we know it's impossible for us to do it the rest of our life? Yes, we can. You can receive the, the love of those words. You can receive the intent of it. And then when you catch yourself arguing, you say, Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Please help me get out of this. Because there's going to be times at your work, times in your school, times what where somebody's going to differ you, and all of a sudden you'll find, catch yourself in an argument, say, Lord, please help me to get out of this, and, and to get straightened out, and to, you know, cut this out. Do all things without complaining and arguing. You're going to find yourself in restaurants complaining about this, and complaining about that, and you're going to be at your job complaining about this, and school complaining. But when you catch yourself doing that, the love and intent of that verse is to start praying, Lord, forgive me, help me get out of this, and help me not to be a complainer. Help me not to be this way. See, uh, Jesus didn't complain. They arrested him the night before he was crucified and everything. They arrested him illegally, according, not according to the law and everything. They uh, 
even held the trial illegally and things like this. He had all kind of reasons that he could have complained and argued back and fought for his way. To let He could have given them a, a piece of his mind. You say, I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind, something like that. Well, don't give them too much. You might not have that much left. But anyway, see, Jesus didn't know. He left all that in the hands of his father. He went to the crosses, and, and that's what makes the devil so mad at him today and everything like that because he set up this great salvation for us if we'll just turn to him. And the devil's doing everything he can to keep people away from the great work that Jesus performed for us on the cross and going to, as a perfect sacrifice. As, and then uh, after the sacrifice for our sins and everything, he was resurrected. And now his resurrection spirit comes back to create in us a new heart, a new life, and we become a child of God. And see, the devil's doing everything he can in our society to keep people from knowing the love of Jesus Christ in our hearts. And Christians, now, we should be confessing to everyone, what is it, Revelation 12, 11 says, And they came, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. See, we need to be sharing what that great salvation means to us individually, what God has done for us, how Christ come into our heart, created a new heart, a new life, and changed us, see. And, but we've got to make sure that we have the Spirit of Christ in our heart. And just knowing about salvation, knowing all the words of salvation, and I mentioned this so many times, I had a friend of mine that preached, and he got saved one night by his own sermon. God spoke to him during the altar call when he was saying, Come forth and surrender your heart and life to the Lord. Receive Christ, your personal Lord and Savior. And he said a voice spoke to him just so clearly in his head and said, You haven't done that. And he said he was so shocked. And he thought, and he said, That's right. I've never done that. He went around before the altar, got on his knees, and received Christ as personal Lord and Savior in front of all of his congregation, and they were shocked, wondering what he was doing. He got up and told them that he had just received Christ as personal Lord and Savior. See, there is something everybody has to do. We must humble ourselves to God's Word in meekness before God, in meekness before all mankind, and saying, Lord, please forgive me my sins. Please come into my heart and save me, and I commit my life to you. We each have to do that. He will not come in uninvited. There is something you must do, or it will be like those people in Matthew chapter 7. Serve the Lord. You know, you can say a lot of good things. You can read the scripture, and you can teach people, you know, out of the scripture and things like this. And God will back up his word if you share it correctly, just like he backed up the word for the donkey in the book of Numbers um, that spoke to Balaam. God spoke through that donkey to Balaam, and he backed up his perfect word to Balaam and through that donkey. And he'll back up his word through people today, too. If they just speak his word. I, I taught Sunday school classes. I can remember now thinking back, you know, like you read a story and then you share that story with the people, and that's called teaching a Sunday school class in, in, in a lot of churches and everything. And that's about all I did, you know. I just read what it said in the book and everything and repeat it back, and we talked about it a little bit, and that was it. But I tell you what, if you share God's Word like that and everything, a lot of good things will happen around you, but it won't be happening in you. See, and that's the difference. They'll be happening around you, but not in you. And that will not be the final answer. Jesus says to those people in Matthew chapter 7, uh, He said, Well, they will tell him that we've done these great and wonderful works. We've prophesied in thy name. We've you know cast out demons and things like this. He's speaking his word. His word will act through them to others. And that's how they did it. They weren't doing it themselves, though. It was just they were repeating his word back. But he's going to say, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That means Christ was never in their heart. They had not taken the time to slow down enough to realize they were missing something. In Acts chapter 10, um, it's such a great story there about Cornelius, a great man, said he prayed always, he gave alms, the people of the community respected him and his family so well, and everything like this. It's just that. It, everything was great for him. People loved him, his family, and all this. 
It said he prayed always and he gave alms, you know, and he helped the poor and all this stuff. But then God sent him a, well, God gave him a vision. In the vision, an angel came to him and said, uh, go send after Simon, Simon the Tanner. He said, go send after Simon and he will tell you what you need to do. And Cornelius was close enough to God to realize and know that that was God coming to him, speaking to him through that angel. So he sent after, uh, now, Cornelius was a Gentile. Gentiles and Jews didn't associate in those days, you know, very little, very little. They just had to maybe sometime. But he sent after Simon, whose name's Peter, you know, we call him now Simon Peter. But anyway, he sent after him. God had to give Peter three visions to get him to go talk to that Gentile. He gave him three visions and then sent Peter over there, and God told him, to go tell him what he needs to do to be saved. And if you read that message in Acts chapters 10 and 11, the message Peter gave to him told him about Jesus. And that's it. He just started telling him about Jesus, telling him about Jesus, telling him about Jesus. And they were so, they received what he was sharing with them and just came alive and just inside their hearts and everything. They just burst out speaking in tongues, prophesying, shouting, and praising the Lord, and you know, like this. And then Peter, when he went back and told the uh, other disciples what happened, he said it was just like us on the day of Pentecost. He said the same thing happened to them that happened to us. And so uh, if any of you uh, are in the teaching that the disciples got saved somewhere else, I can ask uh, John chapter 20 or something like this, the disciples got saved on the day of Pentecost, received Christ into their heart. Jesus, remember, told them to stay until you receive power. Well, who is power? It's Christ. In uh, 1 Corinthians one twenty four, it says, Christ, the power of God. Well, they received power on the day of Pentecost. They received Christ on the day of Pentecost. Christ is the only power of God. The spoken living word of God is the creating power of God of the universe. He creates. He's the only one that can create in us a new heart. We've got to receive him into our heart. You know, Christ is the creating power of God of the universe. Then it says, not only is Christ the power of God, he's the wisdom. He's the perfect word, the wisdom of God. And there's no other wisdom, you know, that can come against him and his word. But uh, so Peter went and told him what he needed to do to be saved. And he received the power of God, too, right there. And they started speaking in tongues, um, shouting and screaming and hollering and everything. And he said, what must we do to be baptized? Something like that. And they baptized them. They got it all taken care of all at once. Now, see, everybody doesn't get, you know, that type of response. But look at what kind of person uh, Cornelius was before they told him about Jesus. He was already a good, knowledgeable, godly person. Uh, knew a lot about God and, you know, everything. Now, look at the disciples before the day of Pentecost. They were good, godly people, too. They had been staying up there fasting and, you know, in the upper room and everything together. They were in unity of the Spirit. And Jesus had told them to wait for the, you know, the till they received power. And they were waiting in faith because, see, they accepted what Jesus said. And they were responding to it by waiting and waiting. And I guess they were waiting in faith. Cornelius was waiting by faith for Peter to come and tell him what to do. And so when he did tell them in, see, both of them responded the same way, just bursting out with worship and praise for the Lord. And Peter says, that's the same thing that happened to us on the day of Pentecost, that happened to Cornelius when Peter was preaching that message of Jesus to him. Now, so see, we've, we've got to have the proper response. And we've got to turn to him with all our heart. It says in Jeremiah twenty nine thirteen, you shall seek me and find me when you turn from me turn to me with all your heart it can't be just well i'm gonna try it I'll, I'm gonna check it out or something like that you know it's got to be a humble and meekness lord please help in the uh, second corinthians three sixteen, it says when the heart of man turns to the lord the veil of separation is lifted when you turn your heart to the lord and say god i want you help me whatever it is i want you you know, like, yeah, just the, the heart crying out to God. That's what God answers to, you know. Now, Peter was telling other people, uh, like in Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, repent, 
Turn from your sins and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent and be baptized. Paul says in um, Romans chapter 12, verse 13, that we're all baptized by one Spirit into the body of Christ. And we're talking about here receiving the, uh, the gift of the Spirit or something like this. Uh, the gift of the Spirit, the promise of the Spirit, was God speaking to Ezekiel in chapter 36, verse 26, like I mentioned earlier, where he promised us a spirit. Uh, Old Testament people didn't have the Spirit of God in them. Now, some did it for particular instances or perform a particular service or something. But like in uh, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart of your flesh give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in you. See something about you know, our hearts. Uh, it's a baptism of the heart into the body of Christ. Uh, if I could find it real quick I, in, in James not James, in First uh, Peter it talks about, I think it's First Peter 3.24, something like that. First Peter 3.24 says here. No, First Peter 3.21 says, like figure whereinto into even baptism does also now save us. And then he says, not to putting away the filth of the flesh, but to answer of a good conscience toward God. See, not to, not to water baptism. The Old Testament people, if anybody converted over to become a Jew, they had to be uh, baptized in water supposedly to remove the filth of the flesh and everything like that and to be cleansed you know, like that to Come a Jew. That was part of the ceremony. But so Peter said, not that kind, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but to answer for good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, that resurrection spirit. Uh, Jesus died on the cross that we would have uh, a Savior, a, a, you know what, we could turn to Him for His sacrifice for us. He performed His sacrifice for us. We turn to Him. And it's through what he did then on the cross that we can come and get forgiveness for our sins any time. Like right now, wherever you are, you can, you can receive forgiveness of your sins and invite Christ to come into your heart. You don't have to wait for a certain time, perform part, sacrifices and everything. Jesus has already done those for you, for all of us. Now, so then after that, though, they got for, the Old Testament people got forgiveness of sins. And then they just went on their way. Their sins were covered until the next time. We get the cleansing from the sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if, if we confess our sins, uh, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's when He puts His Spirit in us and cleanse our, cleanses our heart, creates in us a new heart, a new life and everything, and then puts His Spirit in us. See, that's the resurrection Spirit of God. Christ, we just talked about there in First Peter, oh one twenty four, one twenty one, where it talks about Christ coming into our heart, creating the new heart, the new life. We're baptized in, in our heart, uh, and it's cleansed out, clean, clean new heart. Just like the Old Testament people or people in that day, if they were going to become a Jew, they had to have a clean body. They had to go through baptism to clean out their body and everything like this, supposedly. Well, that's not the way it is today. It's a cleansing of the heart, the baptism of the heart into the body of Christ, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 13. And by one spirit are we all baptized into the body. Now, so... When you're seeking the Lord or when you're sharing with somebody about seeking the Lord, there is something they must have to do to be saved. It's to humble themselves to God's Word, call out to Jesus and ask forgiveness of their sins, invite Him to come into their heart. And if any of you are listening right now that would like to just pray along with me and do that, you know, a simple honest prayer from your heart is all it takes. Like I even mentioned earlier, or something like that. Just say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to please forgive me and cleanse me of my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I surrender my heart and life to you. Invite your spirit, Christ, to come into my heart and create in me the new, clean heart. 
and come into my heart and live. In your name we ask. Amen. Now, you know, it just, it doesn't have to be those exact words like sin well ago in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, when the heart of man turns to God, he just might call it help, you know, something like that. Or whatever, just, just make it an honest confession between you and the Lord, and he will hear and respond. Now, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If we confess with our mouth, Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Righteousness is a result of receiving God's word into our heart. Righteousness is by faith. Romans uh, 3.22 Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, see, we have to accept God's word into our heart, whatever it is, by faith. You know, if we reject any of God's word, you know, that's unbelief. So righteousness comes, God, by faith in Jesus Christ. By receiving Jesus Christ, by receiving Christ into our heart, we're receiving him and his righteousness then. And says then, for the heart man believeth in the righteousness. Well, we're believing Christ in our heart then. And there is no difference. For all have sinned and all come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, being justified by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ. He redeemed us. He bought us back. He's paid the price for us. And that's how we receive that righteousness and redemption, is by accepting his word his life, his spirit into our heart. But there is something we must do. We must invite him to come in, humble ourselves from our pride, from the, all those lusts and things of the flesh, and turn to him and say, Lord, I want you. I'm an honest, truthful heart. And he will certainly come in like a flood, and he'll wash and cleanse your heart, creating you the new heart, the new life, and you will be born of the Spirit then into the body of Christ, no longer just God's creation, but a child of God. John three sixteen seventeen. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, my revision is this for John 3.16 For God so loved the people of the world that he gave his only begotten son Jesus that Jesus should endure the loneliness the suffering of the perfect walk of faith and the painful sufferings of his seven sprinklings of his blood on the cross by the crown of thorns the plucking of his beard the nails in his two feet the nails in his two hands and the terrible stripes on his back that Jesus would go through all this suffering. God allowed these sufferings in his mercy so that all of God's already pre-elected and predestined people prior to birth to die and go to heaven, that they would actually die and go to heaven. That sounds so ridiculous. If only predestined or elected people prior to their birth go to heaven, then there would have been no need for the work and suffering of Jesus. No one's destiny would or will ever be changed by Jesus' suffering and death on the cross for our sins and salvation because everything required for our salvation would have already been done prior to our birth by God's act of electing and predestining us to heaven or hell before birth. After God has predestined us to heaven or hell, there would be no need or no more to be done in heaven and earth. It would already be finished before our birth. So what's happening here is the devil hates Jesus so much that he's come up with this Calvinist, devilish, deceived theology that would have us think that we're predestined or elected prior to birth to go to heaven or hell 
and that would make all the suffering and work of Jesus as our Savior totally unnecessary, totally worthless, and Jesus totally useless. For his life and death on the cross would not change anything prior to, you know, people dying and going to heaven or hell. Because it's already been done by God predestining and electing them to heaven or hell before we were born. See how ridiculous that is. Good day. God bless you. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign.